Thank you to Andy and Kellen for explaining to us health reform. We're all better informed to consumers now about insurance. Did you want to ask a question about that? Is there a health plan that you would prefer for the district? Because I know that one of my clients came in at United Healthcare and was able to get some trans benefits that I hadn't seen any other health plan offer before. So I was wondering if there is something you've identified as perhaps being the first plan. I'll let Kellen go. I'm actually not familiar with which specific plans um, do cover trans benefits. There's an interesting sort of position right now because the benchmark has been selected, but it's going to have to be changed because sort of the way insurance works, it sucks, right? And now what we're trying to do is make it not suck. So those products, the plans that they're trying to sell us are going to have to be changed. And what they're going to need to do is look at other plans in the same state or in D.C and substitute in the benefits that are not currently there. So there's a lot of discussion, and this is, this is sort of a, an interesting point that I'll try to, to cover briefly because I know early um, has been waiting for, for a while. Um, wanting to make sure that in the context of the essential benefits, we're not talking about all kinds of care. There are things that we need services that we need, treatments that we need, that are not, for whatever reason, part of the framework of the essential benefits that the law has set up. So what that means is there may not be, in this particular instance, an opportunity to talk about the entire spectrum of care that transgender people need. But what there is an opportunity to do in every state and in DC is to really underscore the fact that what this is about is about equality, is about are we people for whom the essential benefits are essential, or are you somehow carving us out? And if so, why? And when they have to explain, there's no way to explain a transgender exclusion other than to say, well, actually, frankly, I don't like transgender people. And this is the point where we've really got the insurance companies at the point of the knife where we can say to them, what is this doing in your plan? What is this doing in the context of benefits that are supposed to be essential? I'm the same kind of person that you are. I need preventive services. I need mental and behavioral health services. I need lab tests. I need prescription drugs. I need the kind of health care that I can walk into a doctor's office for. I need the kind of health care I can get in the hospital. And if you're somehow telling me that for me, those services are not essential, there's no other explanation than they think trans people are less, less than men, less than human, less than deserving. And I think we would all agree that now is an excellent opportunity to hit back. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Helen. That was well said. So I'd like to invite Arlene to share her question with the panel. Is that on? Thank you, yes it is. I just wanted to take this opportunity to first say thank you to Christopher Dyer for putting on a just fantastic, diverse, and comprehensive panel of experts in this. Uh, just to see the faces and knowing many of you, I feel very honored to be sitting in, on, in the audience with you. Uh, also, I wanted to say thank you to Linda Walker for just the outstanding um, job and services that you provide on a daily basis. I know I can give it much, but as Thomas knows, I'm always ringing his phone with questions or referrals and a lot of red comments. And Ruby, keep doing what you're doing, sweetheart. You have opened the doors because there has not been a program like yours that's so comprehensive. And not only did, did you open your doors to Latinos, but you have, I see, a lot of your staff and volunteers are, of course, members of the transgender community, African American and otherwise. And I thank you so very much for that. We need to give you a little bit of And last but not least was Debbie McMillan. Some of you probably don't know that Debbie was the only keynote speaker at this year's 2012 International Conference on AIDS. Debbie, you have set the stage around the country for transgender women. And I just applaud you and I tell you and I encourage you to keep
keep on, keep on, keep on. So here's my question. My question is directed to um, Dr. Barbara Lewis, who actually served me for about eight to ten years as one of her patients, and I can say that openly, and I enjoyed that relationship, and I could be a little too much. She's a real doctor. She'll tell you what is good for you, what's not good for you. Um, Dr. Lewis, we have um, quite a few transgenders that come into the jail, as you all know, I go to the Department of Corrections. Many of them have done either two, two things. They've accessed services through this popular, well-known doctor, Benny Rowe, where they've been getting hormones for years. They can't get verification that they've been given hormones, or they access hormones through the black market through being a girlfriend and girlfriend, and they've been on for years. And what we're finding through the transgender committee is that many of them are coming in complaining about high flashes, they're having a lot of problems in terms of not being able to continue to get hormones. The DC jail has a policy that has been amended now that says any transgenders who had not previously been on uh, medications or do not have proof that they have been on medications, even though they may have breast and all that, cannot receive hormones. So my question to you is, what do you think can be done? And I know you get a lot of calls, because your name comes up a lot uh, from those that ask for confirmation. But for women who don't have any real documentation of how they got their hormones, they have breasts, and they're going through the medical process. I mean, the heat flashes and having those problems. What do you recommend that um, I say to the Department of Corrections, or what should we do? to try to get them to make a change of policy, because the doctors over there also don't prescribe medications, hormones. Well, that is a difficult one, because that requires a policy change um, that for the doctors that are actually over there prescribing. Perhaps we can get somebody to, you know, working with the D.C. government to get somebody to go into the jail who is actually willing to see, see patients and offer that as a service. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of calls, but mostly they're because they're my own patients who, for some reason, ended up in DC jail, and they call me for verification of what, what their um, regimen is, and then I, you know, tell them what it is, and then, but then they prescribe it because they prescribe it after they've talked to me. So I think probably what needs to be done is to try to get to uh, our own, uh, Department of Health and see whether or not we can. I mean, I, I think the DC jail is it still contracted out to a private entity, or is it under you? It's uh, private. CTF is. It's, okay. Are you in the medical? The medical unit, yes. It's, it's private now? Yes. And said it yes. Is. So I don't know if there's a way of talking to whatever, whoever the contractor is to see if they could, uh, you know, or we could do we could do a workshop, we could do a training with with uh, that contractor to see if they could learn how to, you know, administer hormones and transgender care. I guess that would probably be to try to get in touch with them. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the key right there, education. Um, and I think we're in a unique position at, at, at Wharton Walker to provide that type of education. Um, and I think it, it, speaking to the clients that come from Southern Virginia and North Carolina and, and Pennsylvania um, to, to get uh, to access transgender women care, it speaks to there's a dearth of qualified providers out there um, who know how to administer hormones in a healthy way. So. I think that's something that we can better um, educate um, providers, the community, um, and, and do some outreach around that. And I think, and I think that's something that we're looking towards in the future. I'll make that happen. Okay. Yeah. Because we, we do that. I, I, we certainly get calls from like student health services. I've had a nurse practitioner from the University of Maryland, and she was more than willing to give some of the students provide her students with hormones, but she wanted some training herself. She would consult with us, so we certainly can be, you know, consulting. Okay. Also, what I think now, because we did an act for policy for the primary corrections, and when we were having conversations um, among many community groups, and particularly the DC Trans Coalition, um, there was no nothing that implied that patients will need to have a previous. Um, I think what happened is we didn't specify what the requirement would be because we had assumed that once hormones were okay, um, we never actually 
we, we worked for almost two years and we won't sue the government for that policy. Yeah. And we never really, you know, once they said, okay, we'll provide the hormones, we really didn't go as far as to who was going to get left out. So I think that that is something that if it's not worked out through, you know, the courtesy that we will give them, we can always go back to the table and demand that that's revised. Because that was something that we thought it was not going to be a problem. So.